Welcome to the fourth video in the series that is critiquing the sample research prospectus that I wrote. So to pick up with where I left off in the previous video, I think that I actually probably got cut off right at the end. What I was saying that is that if you have several um, questions that you would be proposing to ask in an interview and or a survey, then it's probably a good idea in the paper itself to just identify the topics of the questions or to possibly do that and list some sample questions and then refer your reader to an appendix for the full list of questions. Now, one thing you'll notice too when you look at the questions that I've provided in the scripts for the interviews and the appendices is that I don't immediately jump into the questions that I really would want to ask to get my data. What I do is I ask some starter questions and this is a really good idea anytime you're doing an interview because you want to get the participant talking and get a conversation really going and then that helps to ease you into the questions that you really want to collect data about. So here I'm saying I would ask, you know, when did you first really become affiliated with the food bank? So when did your role in that food bank start? What is your actual role with the food bank? And then what responsibilities does your role at the food bank entail? Now, I then do go into four to ask, you know, a little bit more information like this, and this carries on. Um, so again, the idea is to get the participant talking, because if you do that, then you're probably going to get better answers in terms of more in, more involved, more in-depth answers, um, more accurate responses. You'll probably get just better quality data than if you were to immediately jump in to asking the question that you want to ask. So, you know, if I were for the first question to ask um, something about what do I think are the effects of food insecurity on college students, that's the kind of question that um, really you probably would want your interviewee to think a little bit on and isn't a good starter question. I mean, that's a pretty big, complex question. So again, whenever you're setting up interview questions, do allow the first few questions, or at least the first couple of questions, to just be kind of starter questions to get the conversation going. Another thing you'll notice, too, at the end of the interview scripts that I've provided is that I end with this question about, is there anything else you think I should know that I haven't already asked you that you would like to share? And a lot of times, a an interview will tell you, you know, no, you've already really asked me everything that I can think of. You did a great job in the interview, something like that. But sometimes the interviewee actually will tell you something really interesting in response to a question like this that you otherwise didn't get in the interview and may not have thought to even ask. So it's a good idea to end with a kind of question like this that allows for that possibility that you'll get this little bit of information that you otherwise really wouldn't know that may actually be really relevant to your data. Now, if you go through these interview questions too, another thing you'll notice is that these are not simple yes, no questions. And again, going back to that reviewing research methods, PowerPoint that I had prepared for you in an earlier week. If you're doing an interview, you're doing the interview to collect in-depth data. You're not doing an interview to get really simple to answer questions that you could do in a survey. So for an interview, you really are asking or should be asking more complicated questions like the how, the why kinds of questions. So you're going to see that when you go through here. There aren't really questions that are simple yes, no. Um, now that doesn't mean that you can't have have a yes no question but if you do the more than likely you're not just interested in the yes or the no you're interested in the why so you would have a follow-up question so why do you feel that way something like that another thing that you want to keep in mind um, is that whenever you are phrasing your questions it's really important that you are clear and specific about what it is you're trying to ask because if there's any ambiguity around the question then the interviewee is either just going to guess what it is he or she thinks you're asking and the answer then may not be that accurate for your data or the interviewee may have to stop and ask you for clarification and that can break up the flow of the interview so try and be as specific and clear as possible also unless you're inquiring into feelings then you do want to ask your interviewee you know what do you think or what do you believe so that's just something that's kind of stylistic to interviews but you would see that if you read some material about um, effective interviewing techniques and some researchers will recommend to you you know make that distinction between feeling and thinking and use the wording in your question to make that distinction clear so now that we've talked a bit about the appendix I'm going to just go right back up to the content that we were looking at before I moved us down to this part of the paper 
So what you're seeing in this paragraph, which is the first full paragraph on um, page 8, at the top of page 8, in this paragraph what I do is I move from talking about the questions that I would ask to talking about how it is I would actually collect my data or what I would be doing to record my data. Now if you're doing an interview, it's a good idea with permission of the interviewee to actually record that interview, whether with video or audio. But even if you do that, you also do want to write notes by hand because you know you never know whether the technology is going to fail on you and you if you had depended purely on the video recorder or on the audio recorder of your laptop. If something happened to that file, it would be completely lost. Your interview would be completely lost. But if you've been handwriting notes, then you would be able to reconstruct the interview at least to some extent. So you wouldn't have lost all of that data. Now, of course, one thing about hand recording notes during an interview is that you don't want the re or excuse me, you don't want the interviewee to feel like you're not paying attention because if you're looking down at your notebook, scribbling away the whole time, then it's really easy for your interviewee to feel like you're not listening carefully or um, they may not give you quite the in-depth answer or developed answer that you would otherwise get because they're distracted by the constant writing that you're doing. So it is a balancing act, um, writing and listening and speaking, um, but the more you conduct interviews and get that practice, the better that you become at it. Now I do explain in this section then um, asking permission for the ability to use the interviewee's name and what I would do if I did not have that permission and then kind of the, the sequence um, in terms of when and the timing of my project I would ask for that permission. Now, in this next paragraph, I move away from talking about the interviews with food bank staff, the semi-structured interviews, to talking about the survey that I administer to food bank clients. One thing um, that you want to keep in mind is if you are saying you would want to do a survey or even an interview, you need to indicate the format of that. So would this be something done in person or administered you know, online by email? Is this something you would do you know, through Skype if it were an interview, something like that? So do make it clear the actual method of delivery of this interview, or in this case, a survey. So I explained that I think the best approach would be using print surveys and then I give an explanation for that. So I acknowledge that you know dropping off surveys for somebody to fill out may mean that I would actually collect less, less data. However, it's non-threatening or less threatening to do it that way versus being in the food bank and coming up to the clients to ask them for their participation. Because again, you know, there are these potential feelings of embarrassment or shame about being food insecure and depending on the food bank for food and toiletry items. So at least on the initial attempt at recruitment, um, perhaps trying out leaving these print surveys and then coming back to collect them would be a good idea. And then I go through the logistics of that, explaining how I would make it clear that these surveys were there, you know, posting these flyers, explaining and promoting the project, and then that I would have two stations in the food bank where clients could pick up and drop off their surveys. So again, I'm explaining the logistics of my proposed project and again being really specific and detailed because that's more convincing to a panel of judges deciding whether or not to fund your proposal than something that's just left really broad. So you do need to be specific and detailed which our assignment information tells you. So again I'm just going through the logistics of the data collection um, and then you know, also explaining that um, it would be important to include at the top of the survey just a blurb that introduced myself and explained the project. Um, and then below that would be the survey questions. And again, I'm using an appendix for the survey questions rather than embedding them all in the paper. So let's just take a look at that appendix. So Appendix B starts on page 19, so of course it's the references page, then Appendix A, and then Appendix B. You can see the formatting is the same as what you noticed before for Appendix A in terms of labeling of the appendix, double space below that, a descriptor to indicate what is included in the appendix. And then I have a sentence explaining what the content is below, and then I have what would be the actual survey. And so here is the introduction blurb that identifies who I am. You know, I'm claiming I'm an undergraduate student because I'm, I'm writing this as though I'm in your place as a student. And I explain what it is I'm researching. Um, you do want to make it clear what it is you are researching, but that doesn't mean you have to go into 
an extreme amount of detail because you definitely don't want to be so thorough in this explanation that you potentially skew your findings. So just give a basic understanding of what the project is about. Now I then explain what the potential participant would be asked to do if he or she is willing to participate. That would need to be included in this introductory information, which is why it appears. So I indicate that participating in the project means completing this brief survey, and then I also give an estimate of how long it would take to complete. And you would want to do this if you are um, indicating that you know you're seeking this this person's permission or sorry this person's willingness to participate in your project. It's also important to explain um, whether the, the data collection measure would be anonymous or if the participant or potential participant's identity would be in any way um, revealed or potentially revealed. You do want to be clear about that. And you do want to be honest in these things, right? So you don't want to say it's completely anonymous if it's not. You don't want to say that it would take 10 minutes to complete if you've got, you know, 20 questions on there and it's more likely it would take a half hour. So, you know, be conservative in your estimate of how long it would take. If you were actually doing this, then what you would need to do is give this survey to somebody or preferably a few people see how long it takes them to answer the questions, see any places where they had questions or, you know, there's something that needs to be changed in the survey, you would make your adjustments and then you might test it out again and then ultimately settle on a final draft. But since we're not doing that, you know, just use your best judgment how long it may take. Now, I then go on to just give basic instructions, and then of course you see my questions, and you see also the answer options for those questions for which um, answer options would be provided. So whenever you're giving your interview or your survey information in your paper like this, it does need to be specific. It should be what it is you think you would administer to collect your data. So you know you do want it to be clear. You took some time on this. You really thought through the questions you would ask if you're doing a survey or an interview because again your goal is to persuade your reader to fund your research and your reader is not going to be persuaded if they don't have a clear sense of what your questions would involve. So now that that's covered let's just go back up to the paper where we had stopped at before we looked at the appendix. So here in this paragraph I'm giving some more logistics of the project. I'm indicating that I would anticipate the data collection for the surveys would take approximately a month. I explained that I would coordinate with the food bank staff and then because I don't know how many clients there are for the food bank, um, that's information I would get through doing an interview with the food bank staff. I can only really give just estimates here of how many people I would want to recruit, how many food bank clients I would want to recruit. So I'm giving this percentage and then I'm giving just this general number. Okay. And then here I'm acknowledging that, you know, if I didn't collect the data that I wanted to collect, especially given that I would be administering print surveys, that I would potentially revise my methodology and consider administering surveys face to face. But before I did that, I would talk to the faculty sponsor um, for his feedback about, well, his approval and his feedback about how I should approach that. Now, one thing I do in this paragraph here is that I indicate, even though I'm proposing this multi-method approach of semi-structured interviews with food bank staff and then surveys with food bank clients, I recognize that it would be really valuable to actually do semi-structured interviews with food bank clients, but I'm not proposing that for the small-scale pilot study. And then I explain why that is, um, in large part because you know, doing these interviews, that's really time intensive and resource intensive, especially because I would want to be able to give incentives. And I don't mention that specifically in here, but what I focus on is just that it would take more time. And then also there's the issue of building trust with food bank clients. And again, that's a process, right? So with a small scale study, I'm not trying to get all of my data that would be reflective of an ideal study. That's what my large scale study is for. So I essentially tell the reader, you know, I recognize that those interviews would be great, but I wouldn't do that for the pilot study. However, if you look ahead to the large scale project study, or sorry, the large scale study or large scale project section, that's where you're going to see me indicate that I would do these interviews. Now we get into the large scale section, which of course is labeled, as you can see here. 
And then just to kind of start this off to um, make the content cohesive with the previous content, I you know come back to mentioning the small scale research project and what I expect I would find, but then how that information would be insufficient because I really would want that detailed information about effects. And of course, the feedback clients are the best resources for that information.